Welcome to Elevate, the podcast where we dissect exceptional achievers who are consistently raising the bar personally and professionally to produce extraordinary results in investment real estate and ultimately in their lives. Now here's your host, Tyler Chesser. Elevate Nation, welcome back. This is Tyler Chesser. I'm so thankful to have you here. And I want to welcome Elevate Nation back because I always ask this question. It's like, it's like ingrained in my identity now. Elevate Nation, are you ready to take it to another level? Because I know I am. And we are here today with Brian Bradley. And Brian, I want to welcome you to the show. Brian, how are you, sir? I'm great, Tyler. Thanks for having me on and putting the podcast together. And I just hope that I can add some value here to you and your listeners and especially to your, you know, Elevate Nation. And as they're elevating themselves, you know, teach them kind of how to protect themselves and manage their risk and liability better. Absolutely. And, you know, we're going to dive into a lot of that. And I think our show will be wide ranging and very useful for Elevate Nation in many different capacities. But before we get there, I want to remind you that our mission is to identify and apply how the best of the best raise the bar personally and professionally to achieve greatness in real estate and beyond. And this is a masterclass for leaders and those who are looking to achieve uncommon results and purposeful outcomes through real estate investing and ultimately in their lives. And if you appreciate what we're doing, we would appreciate if you subscribe to the show, give us a rating and a review. It certainly goes a long way to, to share that message. I mean, we're ultimately looking to reach millions of people with this message because it's important. You know, most people are just tolerating their life. Most people are, are plugging it in. And, you know, by the time, you know, their, their minimum responsibilities are over with, they're out of there. And, and you know, they're living a life that really is, is there's so much margin left towards living, you know, their greatest capacity. And, And what we're talking about today, you know, it's going to be a personal development journey. It's going to be a professional development journey. It's going to be tactics on real estate investment, as well as legal protection and asset protection. Um, But I want to introduce you to Brian. And so Brian is a leading educator and asset protection attorney for high risk business professionals, entrepreneurs, real estate investors, and high net worth families. Brian's firm focuses on adding value for clients and educating them on what they don't realize they don't know. What Brian does for clients is act as an advisor and focuses on setting up systems and strategic teams to protect your assets and preserve your wealth, which is a great topic for Elevate Nation because we continue to elevate, but we've got to make sure that we've got the proper protections in place, which is a lot of what we'll talk about today. And the goal of, you know, Brian's goal is lifestyle preservation, peace of mind, changing the way that predators view you. And there are a lot of predators out there. And Brian also acts as an in-house counsel and a chief knowledge officer, I love that, for (laughs) firms helping to maximize their value of existing and new products, along with technology integration. Uh, Brian was selected to the Lawyers of Distinction list in 2019, Super Lawyers Rising Star list in 2015, nominated to America's Top 100 High Stakes Litigators list, and nominated to the 2017 Law Firm 500 Award. So, So, Brian... We all love our bios, and you certainly have a very impressive bio here. Um, you know, tell us a little bit more about Brian Bradley behind the bio. Yeah, so like the bio is kind of embarrassing, and I think you know the Brian behind the bio is just uh, a life of pivoting. You know, like I came out of law school when right when we, what are we going to call it? like the Great Recession, Second Great Depression came out, and so there was a time where I literally had to work for free for three years um, just to learn how to practice law. And so it's just been a, a matter of pivoting, how to grow a practice, how to get knowledge, how to make contacts, and then truly staying hold and of, you know, what's your why, what's your driving force behind you. Interesting. So I love the thought of life of pivoting because, you know, one of the books I read years ago was, um, you know, Who Moved My Cheese? One of the most simple books yeah. uh, you could ever imagine. And if you think about it, it's such a, com- you know, it's a, it's a profound concept because really everyone's life is a life of pivoting, you know? Oh, and, it really is. I mean, so you've got to be ready to adapt and in any real estate market and anything in your life, professionally, personally, you got to be ready to change. Change is the only constant. So tell me more about that. I mean, what do you mean about a life of pivoting and where did that begin? Um, I, I think it just began, I always had an entrepreneurial spirit and drive. Um, you know, I'm very atypical personality. I'm very driven very athletic. Um, so I was good in sports growing up, um, always was, you know, in front doing the presentations and 
you know, the entrepreneurial thing was I came from the mountains, like Tahoe. So we would go shovel snow off of people's roofs and decks to go get 50 bucks to go save up to buy a new snowboard or, you know, new boots or ski gear, um, raking leaves and stuff like that, cutting grass, you know, when pe kids are actually still doing that stuff to make money because your parents are like, no, go raise the money yourself. We'll help you. But um, I had to find creative ways to go and get a new snowboard or go and get a new ski book you know, snowboard and all of that stuff. So I just kept developing as I got older. And then uh, I got injured in college playing baseball, you know, and tore up my shoulder and realized I have to actually figure out what I'm going to do with my life now. And so when I got completely derailed from, you know, athletics and realizing I'm not going to be a professional baseball player anymore, I was really insecure on my knowledge side of life. And so I just transitioned all of that competitive nature into – being a scholar and just diving into every book that I possibly can so that no one can ever say, well, you're just a dumb jock. Why do we care what you have to say? And then I always like business. I always like money. I always like financing. Um, and I never really understood what all the pieces of the pie were adding up to in my life because I never read Rich Dad, Poor Dad at that time. And I was really just trying to build a life out of a rat race. And so I was really self-reliant. Um, and when I went to law school, I was originally, you know, supposed to be hired as the next district attorney, you know, in this, the county that I was at, but then the economy tanked right when I graduated law school. So my job offer got rescinded and then I had to figure out what to do, you know, once I passed the bar exam. So then that trickled down into civil law. Uh, all the law firms in the nation were cutting their staffing by half. They realized they had outdated principles of how they're running and operating. Um, the whole industry was just upside down. There were no jobs. They couldn't pay legal bills. They couldn't keep the lights on. They couldn't pay for Westlaw. And being, you know, the first one into a law firm, I realized, well, uh, even though I'm on, only one settling cases, I was the first one cut and laid off. And one of the owners of the firm pulled me up and was like, hey, you know, you have a magic gift. Don't be afraid to jump in the deep end and go it on your own. And I realized, you know, I survived those th first three or four years of practicing when none of my other friends did because I was self-reliant and I just chose to jump and I worked for free literally for three years as long as other organizations covered the legal cost. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, one of the things that's so interesting is that it, it requires, it always requires that leap of faith, right? It's like mm -hmm. the, you got to go through the belly of the beast, so to speak, to be able to get to the other side. And, you know, you also spoke a lot of, of a lot of different things sort of, you know, coming up and, you know, your, your experience with having to pivot who your identity was, you know, as an athlete. And you said, well, wait a minute now. I, you know, because of that, it caused me to, you know, become more inclined to grow as a professional and become a professional. So was, were the, was it like a culmination of all those different events? And as well as coming out, uh, you know, as an attorney, sort of one of the worst economic times in history, was it all of those events in a culmination that caused you to say, look, I'm, I've got to do everything I can to become, you know, great and, you know, to seek excellence? Or was it a personality trait? Or what was it that caused you to say, look, I'm drawing this line in the sand and I'm, I'm, I'm seeking something uncommon. I'm not going to live this ordinary life. How did that occur to you? Yeah, I think it was a combination of all of that. You know, one, I'm, I'm self-driven uh, and I've always been self-taught. And so I've never been afraid to fail. I just look at failure differently. I'm not, ooh, woe is me, I failed. I look at failure as a lesson, learn from it, modify, adapt, overcome, kind of military principle. Don't make the same mistake twice. And so I think failure breeds success. And so the more you fail, the more you're going to learn. And then, the, you know, the faster you're going to succeed. And then I would jump into knowledge and... I never really cared about people's success stories as much as I like to learn about their failures. And so I would copy and mimic successes and then tweak them. But then I more cared about reading and learning about why people failed. So I would have a higher, uh, faster learning rate and just not do those same mistakes. And so when you combine that with my, you know, natural drive and then my reliance to not be afraid of failure, um, I think the line got drawn in the sand with me when I realized no one's going to give me a freebie. You know, the economy is out of my control. A lot of businesses, I don't own the business, so I'm always going to be able to be expendable or replaceable. If you're too good, you're going to be replaced by someone who can do it cheaper and at the same rate. If you don't own it, you have no control. And I learned that 
through the economy of bouncing around during that time of firm to firm to firm who can just pay my bills and then say, hey, well, you know, my son's married to that lawyer, that lawyer is my best friend's this, and you're the new guy on the totem pole. We love you, you know, but sorry, there's nothing that we can, you know, do for you. And that was kind of my line in the sand when I finally drew it and said, you know, I am getting out of this rat race. I'm creating my own identity and my own business. Just jump in and do it. And then I had to learn how to do that. And then that was the next four or five year growing span of, all right, how do I practice law? How do I create a business? And it wasn't until I kind of got into passive cash flow principles and rich dad, poor dad and all of that and realizing law firms fail because or solo practitioners fail in any business because they can't step away from you know, pounding every nail. They wear every single hat and you're going to drown yourself. And so I had to step away and say, how do I create a business? I can't just be client based because if a client doesn't come in, I fail, you know, or if the client doesn't pay their, my bill, I still can't pay my bills. So how do I create a system and a business? And as soon as I started doing that, I actually realized I have more free time. I can be more efficient and I'm just doing what most business owners that are successful do manage my business. So I want to come back to failure here soon and, um, you know, talk about that, but, um, tell me more, you know, cause we're, we're coming in, there's a lot there. Uh, yeah. we're coming in on, you know, creating a business rather than, you know, just a base of clients. And I totally get that. I mean, when I got started in the real estate business, it was like solopreneur life and, you know, yeah, it, it's not recommended for sure because you get on this hamster wheel and it's almost worse than the rat race are working for someone else, you know, so you've got to be careful there. Um, and I love, I love, you keep going back to the rich dad, poor dad thing and, you know, it's a very simple concept, but just switching where you are in that, you know, in the cash flow quadrant is a, it's a process. Um, so tell me about, you know, I want to fast forward kind of today, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, what are you doing currently to, you know, cultivate and improve your own business system? And what are you doing, you know, otherwise to continue to raise the bar in your own practice? Yeah. So um, what I'm doing to, is I, I switched from, having a lot of overhead to decreasing my overhead. Um, I think a, a lot of businesses have to have this uh, perception of, I have this big office. I have all these as associate attorneys that I have to be committed to on an hourly basis. Um, and then they get in a lot of debt. And I just took it into a more functional, modern day way of running a business to where I, don't, I do everything national. Um, my clients, if I'm going to go into court on my own, I'm only going to go into court on states I'm, you know, licensed in, but asset protection, I do nationwide. So I don't need to have this big, massive office and I can save money on, you know, overhead by not having to pay annual salaries. And so I outsource a lot of, um, legal work to independent contractors. And then I incentivize them based off of commission splits, you know, how I can ethically or, you know, if they're licensed or not. Um, to where, okay, you're going to get a base salary off of the client that comes in, but then depending on how we go, now we're going to create an incentive of a percentage off of that, depending you know, on how the settlements come out or where we go. And so I was able to create a business structure around drive and incentive for other entrepreneurial spirited lawyers um, and other business uh, affiliates that I work with. So I created a network of the top asset protection firms as the production side um, who've been around for you know 113 years because they do the best of the best work and then combine that with my litigation expertise and um, it turned into a really good business nucleus. I love our economy now because it, it allows you to be so nimble in you know your structure of the business. It doesn't have to be this big bloated organization to do great work to provide a great service or create a great product. So it's a, such a great reminder. It's like, who cares what, you know, the perception is of your staff and all these different things, you can still provide a great service and be nimble. And also, you know, it's more, the economy is also shifting more and more to 1099 sort of work, you know? Yeah. Um, no, it really is. And it's just the luxury of technology. And then if yeah. you utilize technology, you're going to be more efficient. You're going to have happier uh, work yeah. colleagues. If you're happier and more efficient, who cares where it's getting done at, at the end of yep. the day? I just want high quality work. I want stuff done. And you know, what is it over promise? You know, what is it, you know, under pro over promise on, you know, over deliver, mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah. like yeah. under promise, deliver quicker and under budget, you yeah. know, that's all I care about. Absolutely. Well, so I want to honor elevate nation and, you know, because really the, the fact is, 
if you're going to continue to elevate your life, you're going to continue to elevate your business, your, your portfolio, you've got to be thinking about, well, all right, you, you've got a target on your back now in some ways. Um, so, so talk to us just kind of a, a very high level. Um, and we can certainly drill into any of the details necessary that, you know, Elevate Nation can continue to follow up on. Perhaps they can even uh, build a longer term relationship with you. But tell us about, you know, what are some of the, some of the things that you're seeing in terms of asset protection that many investors are, are really deficient in? Like where are they getting? Like where, where, where are you seeing most of the holes legally um, for real estate investors that they're getting themselves into a risky position? Yeah, I think that it just one, they're not managing their risk and liability at all. You know, like, oh, I'll, I'll set that up later on. I'll set it up when I need it. I said, there's no proactive thought. There's no preventative thought. Um, they think that it goes to kind of cost. Cost is always going to be an upside of procrastination. You know, the longer you wait, the more it's going to cost. You know, so if you do things beforehand, before you need them, before you're under fire, before you're being sued, it's going to be a lot less than in the long run. Um, or I see a lot of problems of people undervaluing the actual services of experts and because they're used to doing everything themselves. Mm -hmm. So they become Google experts, but they don't know how to, you know, cross the T's and dot the I's, what clauses have to go in, how it all actually works together. And they piece this all together on their own. And the next thing you know, they're sued and it doesn't hold up in court. And it's an expensive learning lesson. So I think that they're trying to, especially in real estate, they're used to DIYing or flipping a property or doing all of this with the agents. Um, but then they don't come in and protect themselves from the liability and risk on the, you know, right away. Yeah. I mean, one of my, one of my biggest pet peeves about real estate in general is that it's so reactive. I mean, everything is. It's the heaviest litigated area of law that there is. And so it's like, if you're going to be a real estate investor or you're going to, you know, start investing or creating even businesses, there's just so many ways for you to be sued in that, that you have to be proactive and ahead of it. Because if you think you're going to come back in on the backside, it's going to cost you, you know, it's like, why spend 75 cents on a dollar if you could have protected yourself for five cents on the dollar? Mm Mm-hmm. So most of Elevate Nation is, you know, they're either doing very big things or they're, they're growing to a point where that's in their near future. So, yeah. so give us a couple of, um, you know, a couple of just quick tips on what they need to do to protect their portfolio in a proactive nature. Yeah. So I would say the first thing you want to do is mimic what the rich do. You know, don't own things in your own personal name. You know, so depending on wherever you're at in the totem pole, if you're just starting out or if you're, you know, $100 million, there's going to be different levels of protection that you can do. So when you're looking through what you want to set up, you kind of want to look it through the eyes of effectiveness, control, cost, and maintenance. Those are kind of the main things that people are going to make decisions based off of. So effectiveness, meaning, you know, is this going to actually work uh, as I intend it to, or am I inviting someone to try to pierce it to get a payday? Um, control isn't in the sense of control as people have this outdated mindset of, I have control of my car because it's titled in my name. It's, you know, my house is in my name. That's not the kind of control that you want. That's called liability. So what you want to do is separate beneficial use and enjoyment. You know, I can live in my house, but it's in my trust, but you know, an asset protection trust, not a revocable living trust. Um, I have a yacht, I have a boat, but it's not in my personal name. It's in an LLC or my trust. So you want to remove the liability for you personally and create as many separations as you can, but still be able to use and enjoy them and pass them down. And it all has to come with reasonable costs. You know, if you're just starting out, you're not going to be able to afford an offshore Cook Island Asset Protection Trust. There's no need for you to have to have that. So maybe you should start out with the basic LLC until you outgrow it. Um, And then you just stage up as you go along and then realize there is going to be a point when you outgrow that basic setup. And maintenance fees, people have to add that in the equation. You know, like you can't be spending a lot of money every year on something that you're not going to get a return on an investment out of because you spent it all on the maintenance or your CPA can't figure out how to file the IRS, um, you know, documents because it got too convoluted. And so those are the main things I think that they should be looking at. And then you just stage it up. You know, maybe we start with an LLC. Um, California, there's specific things we do in California with exemptions called private retirement plan exemptions, which are amazing. And then you move into asset protection trusts and either domestic or foreign. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, I think the big takeaway from this is you need to be aware, obviously, as an investor, you're almost a, you're a quarterback of your team. 
And so you've got to be able to build expertise in these different categories. Legal, of course, is one of the most important categories in, ter in terms of being proactive is really the theme of what we're talking about here is, you know, it, it's expecting the unexpected. It's expecting the worst to occur. You know, hope is not a strategy. You don't hope that you don't get sued or, you know, think bad things don't happen. Um, you know, you go ahead and take measures to expect that that will happen. And when it happens, it doesn't bother you. And, you know, not only have you developed yourself to a point where, you know, it doesn't rattle you internally, but it also doesn't rattle you financially and practically as well. Well, and that's a big part of it. And then, you know, it's kind of like you said in the intro of um, educating clients on what they don't know that they don't know. I think people can say like, I don't know this. So I know how to go ask that question and get the answer. But if you don't know what you don't know, that's where most massive losses come from because you didn't even know that you didn't know that. And now you just had a really expensive learning experience. And so that's what we try to educate clients on and shrink that aspect of the pie. And unfortunately, most people own most of their assets in that category of I didn't know what I didn't know. And then they're paying a lot of money on the back end. Um, so that's where the education part of with the clients come in and shrinking that aspect of the pie down. And then as you start growing, you actually can start getting return of investments from the asset protection systems because you're working with amazing trust administrators who, you know, basically are auditing your CPA to find missing dollars, like missing um, tax benefits and credits, which can equate to like 50, 80, hundred thousand dollars a year. And so when you do cost analysis of it, yeah, you might spend 17, $30,000 initially on a setup cost and then $5,000 annually. But then if you're recouping all these missing dollars, it already paid for itself 50 times over from the initial startup cost. And then this is an annual thing. So it's organically living with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, what we're talking about is investments and, you know, investing in your asset protection is another part of that investment, uh, another component. And so, um, so I love that. And so Brian, I want to, I want to transition back to you as, uh, yeah. you know, as a person who's seeking greatness, who's seeking excellence, uh, continually, you talked earlier about failure. Tell me yeah. about, uh, a specific failure that at the time, like maybe had you rattled, uh, but then it turned out to be the seed of a greater opportunity in the future for you. Yeah. Um, you know, like my failures, I don't think so much, like I was saying as failures as it was just you know, really a difficulty getting started and going along, you know, so I always had to keep pivoting myself. And my biggest issue, I think, um, is I have a hard time saying no, you know, so I always feel, okay, I can, <laughs> I, I can do this and I can do it better than most other people. And I had almost gets to the point to where if I really, you know, want you to work with me and I'm like, I really, you really don't understand. You need this. I will almost, I used to almost devalue myself to like, I'll do it for free just to prove a point to you. Um, and so I had to, it was really hard for me to break away from that mindset of, and just learn how to say no. Like so it was maybe, like those, those first three years then, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I got taken advantage of a lot going through just in the economic times, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, I learned a lot. It was great. Um, but I also had to learn how to say no. And then maybe the client themselves, they're vetting me, but I'm vetting you. You may not be a good fit for the profile of my firm and it may cause more strife to have you as a client than I really should have. And sometimes I just got to say, sorry, the fit's not right. So tell me about saying no. Um, what are you, are you getting better at that? And if so, how, um, and what, just what's, <laughs> what's an example of something that you've had to say no to recently? Yeah, just recently I'm getting yeah. better. I'm getting better at it. Um, when I was spending a lot of time in court, I had a horrible time of saying no. But I think it's because I just got so used to for three years working for free, you know, and being able to go up against the big dogs as a new attorney back then and win. I was like, no, I'll just, you know, I like the underdogs. Like I will go and fight for you. I'm, I was used to it. And then it transitioned into my business, you know, my practice now. And I wasn't able to transition that mindset. But um, sometimes you know, when we do an asset analysis or diagnostic, you know, the numbers don't always add up to where it benefits, you know, us um, in the sense of like the clients, clients won't fully qualify. Um, and I don't see the cost value for them in what we're doing. And it's like, hey, I'd love to help you, but there's no cost value that I see in this for both of us or even for you. Um, not all enough of your assets would qualify into this exemption specific plan that we want to use, but they so, you know, exceptionally wanted it. Um, I was like, 
I had to get better at just saying, no, sorry, for your own good, I'm not going to devalue something that we're creating for you to then have it not work. And so I just got really strong and good at saying, no, sorry, walk away. We used to have them sign waiver liabilities and all of this and to say, fine, here, take it. Um, but I got, I, you know, I just didn't want to carry that kind of overhead and I had to get strong at just saying, sorry, no, you know, I appreciate your business, but you know, there's, it doesn't fit for us. Yeah. And I mean, I think people, most people, when you say no, most respectable people respect that in return as well, because it's like, you can't possibly just let things go by the wayside, especially when you're a professional like yourself. And it's like, look, this is not in your best interest, but yeah. I'm not going to, I'm, I'm literally not saying yes to this. So if you, you, would think, you, work with somebody else. you would think I had one guy like two weeks ago, a financial advisor with a big portfolio of clients. And you're like, I'm sorry, you know, it just, it's not a good fit. And he wrote me a horrible email. Like, how dare you say no to me? Like, I'll never bring my clients to you. And I'm like, great. It, it's fine. There's a million other firms, you know, like, yeah. I'm sorry, but it's just not a good fit for us. And yeah. It's, it's also, how do you work with the other person? You know, like you maybe just be more of a headache with both of us and our personalities. That's just going to cause a massive problem. Yeah. And I think saying no is like an investment in the long term. It's like, well, yeah, maybe I missed out on this opportunity today, but now I know that I freed up my time, my, yeah. my energy towards people that are doing the right thing. They're taking my counsel or whatever it is. And so I think that's a good reminder as well. It's like, this is a long game, man. Life is a long game, but especially real estate investment. And so you've got to be able to say no in whatever capacity you're in. So I appreciate you sharing that. Um, tell me about um, who, who, do you, who do you model your life after? Who do you model your business after? Yeah. Uh, because, you know, I, like, we don't have to recreate the wheel, but of course we like to innovate. So I'm just curious. Yeah, so um, it's a good question. I probably going to have an answer that you probably don't really be like, Oh, I didn't think about it that way. But I, I don't really don't have role models um, per se because people are human and humans are fallible. And so, you know, like if you put all of these people up, you know, individuals on pedestals, the likelihood of just being let down completely is really high, you know, like Tiger Woods or all of this. Um, you're just going to be like, Oh my God, I tried to model this person. And now my, you know, I got completely let down. Um, so, but I read a lot. And so I think my role models are just, the lessons I learned through books uh, because I've always had to be self-taught, you know, and I also came out during, you know, a massive recession where I didn't have the luxury of professional role models to walk me along. I just had to, you know, jump in the deep end of this pool and find out if I swim or sink. Mm -hmm. And so that was how my life just panned out. And so, like I said, like no one taught me how to be a good lawyer or a trial lawyer. So I didn't have that luxury. Um, and so I looked to the best people who, of whatever I wanted to do in the nation, you know, um, and then I would either write, you know, call them, write them an email and be like, I just want to talk to you. I'll pay for your coffee. You know, like I just need a little bit of advice or if I couldn't get a hold of them, I would just go buy all their books, you know, or practice books or finance books. And I would just read them all. And then, you know, like Rick Friedman, Gary Spence, David Ball, you know, like for trial lawyers, um, mm -hmm. you know, and I would just mimic what were they so successful at and then put that into my practice. And then what were their failures at? Learn from that. And um, then I would just be proactive. And then I applied the same principles um, in adding the asset protection part of my, you know, my firm by when I started adding the asset protection element, I reached out to the top four asset protection firms in the nation, you know, guys that um, go, you know, teach everybody asset protection. I just wrote to them and called them and said, Hey, like, this is my value. I would love to work with you. I don't want to have any errors for clients. Um, let's find an economical way for us all to work together. And then I just started building it up that way. You know, I love the concept um, that you just discussed about being self-taught um, because there's so many people out there today that in my opinion are not getting what they need through our education system. Yeah. And if you just allow the bare minimum of, you know, definitely a high school degree or even a bachelor's degree or even a more advanced degree, you know, you're really still not getting what you need to really succeed in the real world. And so yeah. you've got to go acquire that information through books. I mean, there's, there's an unlimited amount of information out there. You have to find the appropriate information. You got to find the appropriate experts who are really doing this in the real world that can apply, you can apply this information in your own life. So it's like, you know, you had a blessing of all these different things that can converge into giving you the opportunity to be self-taught because others who are 
you know, formally educated in, in many ways, perhaps don't have this opportunity. So I see it as a blessing. No, I, and, and I wouldn't change it how things played out for me at all. Um, mm -hmm. I just, I just think that um, part of it, you know, with the whole um, self-taught thing is just a lot of people aren't good at, they make a lot of excuses. You know, like I don't have the time to read. I don't have the time. Like that's a bunch of, you know, that's a bunch of BS. Yeah, make the time. Make the time, but even be yeah. more efficient with your time. I listen to audio books, you know, in my car, I work out, you know, like mind, body, soul. It, it's mm -hmm. all, you know, it all has to be worked on while I'm at the gym. I'm responding to emails. If I have to, I'm listening to an audio book or a podcast. I'm learning something, I'm applying it. And then at night I take time to read, you know, something, you know, to actually read and open a book. So I'm, you know, just cause I like to actually have the, you know, the yeah. books. Right Same here. I'm old school with books too. Yeah. I, love, I love the, I just got paper. into the audio books and pot, you know, listening to podcasts because I'm like, I just need to be more efficient with my yep. time. And I found that's the best time to do it. Driving in a car, you know, I'm not listening to music that much. I'm learning something. Yeah. And one thing that keeps coming back to me is how bad do you want it? So, uh, yeah. you know, yes, of course, all of us are pressed on time. I know that is for sure with me and I know it is for you, Brian. And you've got to figure out, well, okay, well, where, where is my time? Where's my low hanging fruit work from there? But also you've got to cultivate habits because if you can't cultivate your appropriate habits, then it's going to be an uphill battle in creating, you know, that time where you can develop your own skills, develop your own knowledge, your own understanding. So I'm curious to know what are some habits that you've installed within your own life? You talked about a few things there, obviously reading, working out, but what else? I mean, what, what is, give us a look behind the curtain there. Yeah, like I'm very much um, a creature of habit, but I also am very adaptable. Um, and so like I'll wake up, you know, I have two, a one-year-old and a three-year-old, so they're waking me up by like six o'clock. Um, so, I, you know, help get the girls, you know, started. And then I'm always reading or listening to something, you know, I'll put on, you know, read them a book and I'll be reading like a law book, or something, you know, investment book. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My three-year-old has a huge vocabulary. I'm like, where did they get That's that book so cool. from? And I'm like, the way that our, our, our household is. Mm -hmm. um, and so my habits are just always based on education and learning. And then I always think there's a learning experience like every second of your day. Like if you just walk around, I just observe things I think differently than most people. Mm -hmm. And so I'll look at, oh, that just happened. Like what's the, you know, my brain will automatically go, why? And then what did I pick up from that? And then I'll, you know, just, or I'll watch a movie and I'm like, oh, you know, I look at the underlining of what, what's the point of the story of the movie versus just like, okay, I watched a, you know, Hollywood flick and now I'm, you know, there's a reason I'm watching it. What's the point of this, the author is trying to tell me. If you reframe your life from a curious perspective, there's always something to learn. And once you just really embrace that curiosity, it becomes so much fun because it there's really, always something to learn. It really is. And, it, and that's, a, and that's true. And I think you just, if you just start taking out the excuses and then, you know, like what I was going to say is if people identify, like you're saying the driving force, the why, not like the why of your business, that's fine. Like you can go and watch, I forget who the guy is that talks about that, you know, Simon um, Sinek. Yeah. 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 It's, a, it's a great, you know, point. I love it. I applied it in my own business, Same. but if you identify that in your own personal life, you're going to light a fire under your butt. You know, and whether it's like for me, it's my kids, you know, my daughter's like, I don't want to be in a wheel running around and not, you know, like I'm dance dad, soccer dad and gymnastics dad, because I created a system that frees up a lot of my time to be it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, my wife works nights at a hospital. So if I can then systemize this to where she doesn't have to be, you know, working nights at the hospital, 12 hour mm -hmm. night shifts, that's, you know, my driving force, you know. It's all about your outcomes, you know, and I think it's such an amazing thing, too. That's like it's so, I feel like it's a little bit unique in sort of this time period in the world. It's like I, I recently read uh, the biography of Leonardo da Vinci and it was talking about the Renaissance era, you know, in the back in the 14 and 1500s. And I feel like we're in a re Renaissance era again today. Yeah. And we have the opportunity of sharing this information, this these tactics, these, you know, these habits with our children or with you know other people who we influence and I think it's such an amazing thing but also like when you share it like you're sharing with your children your young children you're reading yeah. legal books that you know you see it as the outcome towards creating you know what you want in your life and they're you know soaking it up too because they're like man dad loves this you know yeah I think totally. it's an amazing thing no, so. it is and my buddy had a great point we talked you know get like a little week together powwow with cigars in the fire pit you know and 
we talked about books and stuff that we're doing and, and it goes to the adage, you know, like you talk to 10 people, it's like the 1% rule, you know, 80% mm-hmm. it's like, psh, whatever, great. Yeah. You know, 2% will hear what you're saying. And then that there's only 1% will actually apply it. So if you're going to learn something, read something, don't just read it and say, okay, I accumulated that knowledge. You got apply what you learn. 100%. That is what I say all the time. People ask me all the time, how do you remember all the stuff you read? Because I'm like you, I love books. I'm obsessed yeah. with reading, but I just apply immediately. Mm-hmm. And then, then it just anchors into my nervous system, my subconscious. Yeah. I don't know. It just stays there. And they're like, oh, you must have like a photographic memory. I'm like, no, I probably, I really don't. It's just, I apply, you know, I learn by action and doing. Yep. I just read and I apply and I do. And then it's just muscle memory, you know, and the brain's a muscle. Yes. And as you read, your muscle gets stronger. It's not yep. just acquiring that information, but it's a workout for the mind, which is the most important component mm-hmm. of your entire physiology. So yep. yeah, I'm, at least that's my opinion. But uh, tell me about an investment that you've made either in yourself or in your business that has been something extremely worthwhile over the past year or so. Um. Yeah. So I've been you know, uh, a CRM, you know, for my, mm-hmm. biz, you know, I like use it, utilizing, uh, you know, technology and yep. I was still old school of like notes and this and like yeah. post-its and, you know, it got to where I'm like, I just have to, you know, take the bot, you know, bite of the bullet here and jump into the cost and get a CRM to function, mm-hmm. you know, my life a little bit better. Um, and it was a big, good investment and it was, you know, really good business and personal lives. Yeah, one of the I've heard this question a lot. It's like, well, which CRM do you use? And I, I'm like you, I invested in a CRM. And, and I've heard, also heard that it's like, the, the best CRM is the one that you're going to use. Because yeah. you, if you invest in it, you've got to continue to, to keep that, you know, up to date and, and, um, you know, keep growing it and these different things. So it's like, you've got to stay on it, which is yeah. same of everything. You know, if you're going to invest in anything, it's about your behavior not just the monetary value, unless you're a passive investor in a syndication, perhaps uh, you still need to be an asset manager of that, of those funds, in my opinion. So you've always got to be active and no matter what you do, no matter what type of investment it is, whether it's for your personal development, your business, your financial you know, capacity, it's all about being active and, and your behavior shift as well. Um, so tell me about goals. I want to talk about uh, some goals that, that you have been proud of accomplishing uh maybe maybe what's one goal that you've been proud of accomplishing over the past year yeah over the last year i really worked hard on um going from you know not so there's a difference if you're familiar with like the cash flow quadrant of yep. you know being an employee to being self-employed and transitioning to a business owner and an mm-hmm. investor i originally was just running everything as a self-employed you know a solo business owner and it took me a year or two to transition it to actually owning a business, which means I can walk away from it and it still exists and I can make money off of it and it's passive versus, you know, I was only contingent upon surviving off of each client that was coming in. Mm -hmm. And why do most law firms or businesses fail is because you can't run everything on your own. So even if you can, and you get past that seven year mark on your own, you're going to be so mentally fatigued and tired and drowned drowning that you're just going to collapse and be done. And, um, I took, you know, the hard step for the last two years of really just systemizing my entire practice and then making really good affiliations with, you know, firms, you know, and legal production teams and financial investors to like really make this a fine tuned machine. And now it's all just come together. And I've had friends and other clients that are like, man, you know, like we're calling you and you're at the park with your kid, you know, and everything's getting done. Like, how did you do this? This is amazing. And I, it was really just, I jumped into the pool of you know, the principles and applied of the rich dad, poor dad, cash flow mindset of how to systemize a business. Because if it's not systemized, it's, it, there's nothing passive about it. It's just a continuation of the wheel. So that's my biggest accomplishment, I think, on a business side, you know. Mm-hmm of things is just systemizing my practice. I think um, another distinction just for all of us to remind ourselves is that, you know, what, what other, whatever place of the cash flow quadrant that you find yourself right now, let's just say, say either you're in the employee side or the self-employed side, or, you know, you're, you're in the business quadrant, you know, it is a process to get to the next phase of that, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. So don't kick yourself. If you're look, man, you're self-employed. Oh my gosh, I know I get it. Like I've been there too. And it's a process. You've got to build these systems, your processes, 
um, your procedures, you know, you've got to build out, well, what's our checklist look like for this? And, and who can I leverage? You know, what resources can we bring in? What people need an opportunity or, or would like to have the opportunity of complying with the system? And I would just to say, expect to fail and then learn yeah. from it and then modify because, you know, I didn't just automatically pop up like, oh my God, this is how I systemize my, my law practice. Mm -hmm. It took a long time. And then a lot of bad partnerships that failed for different reasons of why um, to work out the kinks in the system. And so it was really um, a learning, a, a multi-year learning process. But Robert Kiyosaki's was like a long process too and everybody else's and people were yeah. even telling him like, what's going on? You know, and my parents were even like, what is going on? Like, why are you doing this? And then when it turned the corner, everyone realized, oh, wow, it worked. We see it. <laughs> Yeah. And it's like everybody says, it's like, man, you're an overnight success, but it's like, you didn't see the nights, you know, the weekends, the, the hard, you know, long period of time that it took to really, like you said, expect that failure, you know, modify and then apply again, fail yeah. again, keep failing until you succeed. And so yeah. military um, principles, yeah. amplify, modify, adapt and overcome. Like, you know, great Love principle it. for life. Love it. Love it. So it's an uncomfortable process, right? Uh, yeah. Tell me, what are you inspired and uncomfortably working towards now as a goal? Um, I don't really, honestly, I don't really think I have something that I'm uncomfortably working on, you know, right now. Like I, I like working on problems and I don't see things as problems. I just see business as, you know, life goals and, you know, business as business. So uh, it's kind of an, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to answer that question because I don't. Well, it seems like you've just reached such a level of comfort with being uncomfortable that it's not uncomfortable to you. Anymore. I don't, I just don't see problems like people do as like drowning in them. Something will come yeah. my way and it's like, okay, assess and move on from there. You know, like there's going to be a solution. I may not have the solution right now, mm -hmm. but the great thing, like one of my buddies told me is like, we come to you and they help me modify my business structure because you know, everybody who's the best of the best at what they do to, you know, solve a problem and that's why we come to you so he helped me restructure my business on the concept of it of what i am you know like you're the point guard and that's what people mm -hmm. should be coming to you for mm -hmm. and that's how i apply everything that is a problem in my life or business is there's a solution who do, if i don't know the answer who do i talk to you know like i'm going to come up with an answer to something or if i just have yep. to cut ties with it i cut ties with it you know mm -hmm. and so that's just the way i look at life there's a solution for everything. It's just a matter of how committed you are. You know, I ask people all the time, are you interested or are you committed? Because if you're interested, then when the problem comes up, you know, you're knocked off your course, you just give up or are you committed, you get knocked off course and you say, I was expecting to get knocked off course. Uh, I'm ready for I, this. Yeah. And yeah. my parents, when I was, you know, like really diving into restructuring this business, they're like, why don't you just go back and work for a firm or go back to the DA's office and be a prosecutor? Yeah. And I'm like, because I'm not committed then to my practice and I can't have a practice on the side and a business on the side. And then, right. you know, I'm then half, you know, a in it to the people who are paying me to go and represent them there or to the state that I would be prosecuting, you know, criminals for. So I'm like, I have to be committed to what I want and my goal. I love it, man. Well, you, you, um, you embody elevate nation. That's for sure. So what we want to do now is we want to transition into our rapid fire section Okay. We call is this the rare air questionnaire. And the reason why we call it that is because you're theoretically climbing the mountain and mm -hmm. you're reaching the peak. And most people gave up way before we reached the clouds, way before yeah. it really got tough. But we've continued through that discomfort, through the challenges, through the, you know, the, the, the forks in the path. And so, you know, we talked a lot about books and I see the bookshelf behind you. If you're not watching yeah. on YouTube, uh, you should definitely check it out on YouTube because he's got a beautiful uh, bookshelf here, which is always an exciting sight, in my opinion. And I think most of Elevate Nation would agree. So I'm just curious to know, um, you know, we've talked about a few books, but yeah. what's the most impactful book that you've ever read and why? Um, that's a really hard question because it's like I know. Candy, candy, candy shop. But um, you can give me a couple. Uh, most people break the rule and give me a couple at least. Yeah, no, I mean... Um, I would say the, the one that I always give people if I, you know, when I first meet them or as guests, um, The Alchemist. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, it, it goes hand in hand with the other books we've been talking about, like Rich Dad, Poor Dad and The Richest Man of Babylon and things like mm -hmm. that. Because mm -hmm. it's on, you know, the internal journey level about what those guys are talking about professionally. So, you're, you know, it's about following your heart and this desire, no matter how crazy it can sound. Yeah. And then also just learning to listen to your heart and the language of the world um, and learning just at the end of the day, 
like we've been talking about, how to pivot. You know, like life's going to be full of problems and heartaches and um, shortcomings. How do you move on from that? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is so much in alignment with what we talk about uh, because, you know, some people say, why, don't, why can't we just talk about the tactics here, guys? Like, we just want to know, you know, how do we protect our assets and how do we, you know, maximize our cash on cash? At the end of the day, business is a spiritual game. And if you can't handle your own internal turmoil, if you can't learn that this journey is like, you know, you've got to be able to, you know, make the appropriate decisions and continue to ascend upon that path, then, you know, you're really not going to get where you want to go. And so I love the thought of, you know, the alchemist as being something that, uh, that you recommend because it's, it's about following your sort of your inner purpose, your inner desires, you know, your, your greatest capacities. And so yeah, it's a kid uh, that dropped everything that he knew being a shepherd and then started following this crazy dream. Exactly. Exactly. So you got to have some faith, right? You gotta, yeah. You got to jump into the deep end, sink or swim. You know, you'll be amazed how fast of a swimmer you'll be if you let yourself just swim. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. So what's the biggest way that you elevate your life on a daily basis? Um, just through re reading a lot and reflection. Um, I'm one of those that, you know, being an A type personality, it's a big fight of wanting to, you know, an alpha male type of personality. Like I want to go and conquer like right now. Yeah. So I yeah. had to learn to sit back and channel that energy into reflection and thought. Um, so sometimes people will sit there and especially when I was like taking the bar exam and you know, the lady next to me was like, I didn't even know when you're going to start typing. And I would just, I was reading everything and I was just formulating the answer in my head. And the next thing you know, it was like, and I was done in, you know, the typing part in 20 minutes and I finished each section of the bar exam. Like I've had like four licenses, like I did it each time, you know, it was like three hours each section. I finished each one in like an hour and I obviously passed and they're like, what was going on? I'm like, I was just reflecting. And so I think that's part, you know, part of what I do is I read, I think I analyze, I spend a lot of time reflecting on my day, my thought process, where I might've gone wrong in it and then tweaking it and then exercising. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't have reflection built into their life or obviously their business just because there's a, a constant flow of information. As we were talking about earlier, you can acquire any piece of information you want. Most of it's free. Um, but if you don't take time to really kind of read in between the lines, so to speak, and say, well, mm -hmm. what's missing from this information? What's missing from this book or, you know, whatever it is to be able to reflect on, well, how does this actually impact me? And how is this how is this something that I can act on or should I be acting on it at all? Should I mm -hmm. be acquiring this information? And so it's a great reminder to just kind of step back and really, you know, have some contemplative thought. So That's, yeah, that. and it's a hard lesson to learn. Like even now, even times, especially if you're a type personality, it's going to be yeah. really, it's really hard for me still. And I try to actively practice it. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, it sounds like something that you're uncomfortably continue to work towards. So I love yeah. that. So how do you elevate others around you? Um, I just like to share as much as I can about what I read and knowledge, you know, like you're not going to, you know, bench press your way through all the life's problems. So the only thing you really have is your brain power. And so as I read, I know most people aren't going to consume as much as I have. And so I just like to share and pass down as much as I can. This is the only thing I can really give of true value. I think of people, you know, I'm not into monetary gifts. You know, a lot of other people are, um, I think I just like to share I learned this, I read this, like this is how I'm applying it. And then it starts always, I love philosophy, like as a philosophy student, and it always starts great conversations and people are always feeling uplifted after I talk to them because like, I didn't think about it from that perspective or I got to go get that book now. And so that's what I try to do to elevate other people, like on a personal level is just share what I've read or, you know, tidbits that I find that they might need to you know, know about without saying like, Hey, you need to know this. You know, I'll just throw it into a conversation nonchalantly. Well, there's no greater gift than providing, you know, information and knowledge and wisdom to other people that they can act upon and they can, you know, they can create, you know, within their own life and they can, they can with, you know, go around the challenges that we've all, you know, we've all run into, but you know what, you can learn so much from someone else. So I appreciate, uh, appreciate that about you very much. And, uh, and Brian. This has been awesome, man. I, I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to yeah. be on the show. Um, Felivate Nation wants to stay in contact with you. How can they do that? Yeah, so um, I'm on LinkedIn all the time. You know, that's a great place, Brian T. Bradley. Um, my website, www.btblegal.com. And I got tons of educational information on there. And 
We also do, I have a link to a free diagnostic that people fill out. Um, takes about five minutes. And I used to charge to go over the diagnostic with them, but I just would rather people fill out the diagnostic, figure out what we can possibly do for them, pick up the phone, we'll call you, set up an appointment, and then just go over the initial review for free just so you have an idea of what you need and what can and can't be done. Whether people decide to retain us or not, that's another thing. Like go take the diagnostic and go somewhere else. Maybe, you know, they'll do something cheaper. Maybe it'll be better or worse. I don't know. But I'd rather you just have the education, you know, and the conversation for free and not say, I'm not going to call because I don't want to pay a consultation fee. Yeah. And I highly encourage Elevate Nation to take Brian up on that offer. Um, it's, it's, it's a free initial consultation, free diagnostic. So, so go check him out and stay in contact with Brian because he's putting out a lot of great content. He's sharing that information with many people for free. I mean, this is, this is something that he's doing to contribute. He's elevating many, many others. And, and so, um, you know, I want to remind Elevate Nation that there's a lot here. You've got to go back and like, the key is repetition, right? You got to play this show again, take notes, because it is all about applying, you know, immediately to be able to really elevate your own results. And so you've also got to take massive action. You know, it's not just consuming. It's not just learning. It is about anchoring that into your nervous system. And so, uh, you know, really that's, that's our show for today. And Brian, I want to thank you again for being here and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Yeah, definitely. Thanks Ty. Absolutely. My friend. Bye everybody. Thank you for listening to Elevate. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and pay it forward by sharing with a friend. Most importantly, take this opportunity to elevate your results by taking immediate action on what you learned. For more, visit tylerchesser.com.